Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Michael Fortin. The French-Canadian actual pronunciation is Michel Forte. He is one of the legends of copywriting, and Michael's been direct response copywriter for over 20 years. He's been instrumental in generating several hundreds of millions of dollars in sales for his clients. He's been dubbed the Roger Bannister of online copy, as we'll see why. One of his sales letters sold over $1.08 million online in the first day. And then a few weeks later, a sales, le- a sales letter in a completely different niche generated $1.04 million. And this is just to name a few of his successful campaigns, which we will dive into. Michael or Michelle, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Jeremy. And, you know, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, some of the mistakes along the journey, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact. And this isn't necessarily a fun fact, but a fact about you is you have Asperger's. How does that affect you? Here's the funniest thing about learning to have Asperger's or learning that I have Asperger's is I tell the story, I've been telling the story for the last 20 years about how I started in copywriting. And long story short, uh, I grew up with an alcoholic father who don't has make a mental... it. Don't make the short story. I want to hear the whole version of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, well, the, here, here it is: is that my my father, who has a mental illness called Korsakoff's disease, um, and and essentially, I grew up uh, him treating me as a failure, calling me the failure, and and I was abused as a child. But wow. the, the the bottom line is, I grew up with this immense fear of rejection. Uh, which I later found out partly was based on Asperger's, but I'm coming to that. What happened was I wanted to fight that fear. You know, there's a quote that goes, um, "Do what you fear, and the death of that fear is certain." So I decided to jump into sales. What I mean, what better way is there to fight the fear of rejection than to be rejected all the time? And uh, basically, I, I failed miserably. I became exactly what my father said. I, I just I was afraid of knocking on doors. But later on, I found out that because of Asperger's, I hated personal interaction. I hated socializing, especially at that young age. I was I gotten used to it more and more as I as I grew older, but when I was 18, 19, I I dove into sales. I was income uh, sales commission only income and having a I had a brand new family. Uh, I adopted a daughter at that time. Uh, it was it was tremendously hard for me. So actually I declared bankruptcy at the young age of 21 years old just wow. to pay the bills. Um, and then uh, over time, what happened was uh, I said to myself, there's got to be a way for me to stop being rejected. How can I stop knocking on doors or doing cold calls to get people to at least just listen to what I have to say with my sales presentation? I was uh, working for an insurance company at that time. And so I decided to do this thing called lead generation sales copy, where I would write a letter and then I would mail it to people in my area. And then the phone calls that I would get, I would get a small percentage of people calling me to book an appointment. I would no longer have to be rejected because they're actually booking the appointment with me. So 50% of the sale was made. So when I went to the interview, I they wanted it. I knew I, do, I wasn't going to be rejected. They asked for it. And I went from a bankrupt failure to the number one salesperson for eight months in a row for a major Fortune 500 corporation in Canada. Wow. And, and that's what p- propelled me into the world of, of copywriting. But just to answer your question, um, I found out later on through, through diagnosis, self-diagnosis, not, not official diagnosis, but uh, I, did two, I did three tests and I found out that I have or have the propensity to have uh, Asperger's. And it answered, it opened my mind so much because when I learned about the, the, the wanting to avoid social interaction, the uh, missing social cues, uh, it, it made me understand why I did a lot of what I did, but also at the same time, it made me understand why copywriting became a strength for me. Because of the fact that uh, one of the things that Asperger's and autistic people do is they mimic. They, they don't do out of pure empathy, so to speak. They do it because they, they mimic other people and they can connect with them. And I found out that that was the number one thing that made me successful in copy and will make anyone successful in copy is the connection between the product or the product benefits, the seller of the product, and the market. And the, the connection is the message. The, the connection is how, the, how do you connect with your market. And the better the connection is, the more sales you're going to make. And that's through 
uh, learning more about your market and being like them, making them feel like they understand you understand them, that they're like you, and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. that's part of what what helped me out. That little quirk, as you say, that little funny story or that little funny. Uh, uh, I don't know if I term it funny, but it's definitely you know maybe something I would never know that looking at you or even interacting with you. How did that? Like just to back up, and I want to hear of kind of how you progressed through the sales and, and as a copywriter too. But how did it affect you? Um, how did Asperger's affect you? Because um, it probably wasn't diagnosed early on, right? No, no. Um, one of the things that Asperger's people have a tendency to do is they tend to lecture a lot. <laughs> I, I and I and I. This is a perfect, that, perfect avenue then right now because I'm just going to yeah. sit back and listen. Uh, Asperger's people are known to be good teachers, uh, speakers, and I. When I spoke on stage, I always feared the social interaction, of course, but I never really looked at people. I always looked above their heads. Um, you hear stories of of professional speakers saying, "No, just just pretend they're all new in your mind." <laughs> It breaks down the butterflies or whatever the case is. But I didn't do that. I was just basically not looking at people. Mm. I hate looking at people in the eyes. Mm. Um, and it's it, that's part of Asperger's. But I didn't know that at that time. Um, but it also helps me in... Uh, here's another thing about Asperger's that I love. is I, When I tend to dive into a topic, I dive in full force. I really immerse, I get engrossed in that topic. And it's, mm. it's, it's very much a, an Asperger's uh, thing. And that was very good for me because if I were to take on a new client in a new niche, the one thing that I did most of all is spend time, a lot of time, on researching the product, researching especially the market. I would just immerse myself. I would get engrossed by it. I would take, for example, two-thirds to three-quarters of my time on a, copy, on a copywriting job uh, just doing research, looking at competitors, uh, interviewing clients. Uh, looking up YouTube videos on the product, on the product benefits or alternatives, what makes them better, what makes them worse. So I would get so engrossed in, in knowing the market, knowing the product so deeply that writing copy was just a natural extension of that. Now, that being said, I when I grew up in, in the beginning as a salesperson, I tend to, I wanted to beat my fear of rejection at that time, what I thought was my fear of rejection, yeah. which is... I, I still do have. I mean, that's pretty forward thinking for a young kid like that to, to think that way because most people would just let that overtake them. How did you right. prevent it from allowing to overtake you and actually kind of thrust yourself in worst case scenario for you at that time, which is a sales job? Well, well, he, here's the thing is that at that time, the sales manager of my very first job was a, a big proponent of self-help sales training. And I literally turned, I was a salesperson on the road with a car, so I literally turned my car into a university on wheels. And I'm not sure if you remember these in the old days of Nightingale Conant tapes from Zig Ziglar, sure, Tom Hopkins, course. Brian Tracy. I got immersed, I immersed myself completely and fully into that. So, and that's that mimicking part of my brain that that helped me because when I wrote copy, all I, all, it was easy for me to just translate or copy what I learned in a sales presentation, going through the entire sales presentation from the, 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 the qualification process all the way to the presentation, all the way to closing questions, test closes and all that stuff, and then, and then asking for the order, transferring that to a sales or a, sorry, a written form of that sales presentation. And that's what copywriting is. It's just as the old saying says, you know, it's salesmanship and print. Well, for me, it was easy. And I guess my Asperger's part of my brain connected those two and said, hey, this is just an easy, it's just a natural transition. Um, so it was never really a, st a stickler. Uh, but up until that time, it was, t it was tremendously hard for me mm -hmm. because uh, I, I remember days where I would be locked in my room. Uh, sitting in the corner, depressed, crying. I just hated. I, I I never really liked going to school because I hate interacting with kids at that time. I never really hung out with kids at my age. Right. Um, and then uh, when I went into my job, it was I I hated going out on the road trying to knock on doors. And I knew I had to do it. And I when I first did it, and I remember the very first rejections that I've gotten, uh, it depressed me for two weeks. I was in a big depression because wow. I thought they were rejecting me. And I see. It's, it, it was tremendously hard, but to go, when, I, when I found copywriting, when that was, that was the, the big hump, it became the, the thing that literally changed my life. Yeah. 
And it sounds like that was the perfect coping mechanism for yep. rejection because you get them coming to you. Yep. I'm still curious about when you first took that sales job, you had to get over all those fears to even apply for that sales job. How did you get to that point? Because you could have just have taken like some, you know, back computer job where you didn't have interaction with people. What got you to the point where you, you know, got to the next level and went into a sales job even? How, I mean, it sounds like you were in the corner, in your bedroom, depressed. How do you get from there to even wanting to do or trying well, to do a sales job? It, it, it was actually the my first job in the insurance business uh, was fairly easy to to get because it wasn't a really an interview. It was a test. They actually pers they, they they made you make you pass a personality profile test. Um, and it's also I think it was uh, it has it was half personality. And the other half was ethics to see, you know, because you're dealing with money, you're dealing with insurance, you're dealing with premiums and so on and so forth. So the interview process wasn't really face to face as much as it was written test. And I was good at tests. I mean, I was, uh, I would call myself at least good enough in school. I had high grades in school, but a lot of it was just because I was good at memorizing stuff. Um, and so that was part of it. The second part is, like I told you earlier, that speaking, lecturing is a big part of it. Well, that sort of came from my love of theater. I was, I loved acting. I loved, uh, I, I played in a lot of theater in school. It was my only extracurricular activity besides playing drums in, in school bands. Um, I was also an actor. I, was play, I did plays in school in French and in English. And so when I was interviewed or when I went into that sales job, all I had to do is watch somebody do a sales presentation and I would mimic them and I would probably do it almost exactly the same uh, to, my, to my detriment sometimes because you have to mold yourself to different situations. You have to be able to think on your feet and change the, 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 the connection process with your client. So that was how I got in that first job. And, and when that transitioned to the copywriting, well, then it was easy for me to to get any other job after that because then I became a freelancer and then at this point I was getting clients rather than uh, employment. Yeah, so early on the sales you were selling insurance? Yes. And so you said you had to file for bankruptcy mm -hmm. at that point. So what was working with your sales and what was not working with your, you know, the methods that you were using? Are, are you saying whenever I declare bankruptcy or? No, I mean before and then after because obviously you know your methods uh, what were you trying that wasn't working um, and then after you discovered the copywriting what did you start to implement well that was it it was it, the, the copywriting aspect of it was uh, the biggest part of it because then I would just do mail outs or I would send letters to people that I was when people were um, giving me a presentation or when I was uh, sorry when I was doing a presentation with uh, clients the the one of the aspects of the business was to ask for three referrals and that was that's pretty common in a lot of door-to-door uh, -door jobs well I asked for the referrals but rather than calling them up I would send them letters and that would get me more presentations which would get me more sales I didn't last too long in the industry because I I was limited and I felt like I had to work really hard to make just a small amount of percentage in commissions which is why I decided to go into consulting and copywriting and I I was calling myself a marketing consultant although I was primarily a copywriter and one of my very first clients at that time was in the cosmetic surgery industry uh, namely a hair transplant doctor and that I, I've gotten some of my very biggest successes in that industry and then that just transferred into the cosmetic surgery industry into the health and beauty industry all the way to today which is the fitness industry although I've written for probably you know, 200 different types of niches since then but that is sort of the industry that I'm, I'm mostly uh, immersed myself in and, and have more experience in. When you first started writing those letters did you just mm -hmm. kind of ad-lib or did you actually learn from certain books how did you actually oh I always found the, the foot in the door whatever the excuse was whatever the foot in the door that can allow me to do that here's an example I would never ask for a person to call for a consultation even if it was as simple as uh, I want to do a needs analysis on your your finances it was never anything like that I had for example at the time when I started to do that 
the company that I was working for had uh, put out a brand new product uh, that was tied to a charitable organization or a charitable uh, uh, process where you can actually give uh, you write down as a beneficiary on your on your policy a charity of your choice and they had a name on it I think it was, I can't remember what it's called it was I think it was called something like charity plus so and and that was something I said hey I can call people I sorry not call but write copy to, to, to get people to ask for a pre, uh, consultation telling them about this brand new product this charity plus thing and how it can benefit you and listen I'd love to take just five minutes of your time to explain to you how this works if you are thinking about donating to a charity of your choice uh, this is a great way to do it and and you know, all the tax benefits that came out to that so that was the foot in the door same idea as um, for example when I first had my this is one of my biggest successes which is my first job or my first client as a, a copywriter um, I got into this hair transplant uh, company and here's the thing they've been around for years what happens is when a person mostly men who are losing their hair they have a consultation with the doctor they have to fill out this form the doctor takes their measurements uh, all that stuff about how much hair loss they have and all that stuff and if they if they buy or they, they book a consult or a book uh, uh, the surgery uh, that file then gets into puts into is put into a patient chart or a, a, a client uh, a folder but there were tons of people who didn't go ahead of course because I mean the surgery is pretty expensive it's especially expensive, elective surgery. yeah but what happened was when I first worked at work there I worked there for less than a year and I did you know normal work as a marketing consultant and then one day we we did we were doing some spring cleaning and I stumbled onto his closet which was filled with these consultation forms from people who never bought literally piles and piles I mean thousands of these consultations from years and at that time um, they've introduced a brand new procedure which was called micrografting which is transplanting one hair at a time which makes it look much more natural compared to the old plug technique which was these large I've punched. seen those yeah yeah right so so the new technology and all these forms sitting together was hey that's my foot in the door so what I decided to do is we hired a data entry clerk we had all of this stuff put into a computer because he he just got a new computer this my client at that time because computers weren't uh, around uh, a lot back then this is the the early 90s in this particular industry I mean um, we've gotten all this data entered we've created a letter explaining this there's a brand new technology it's so much more advanced it's state of the art would you like to know more about it please call us back for a consultation and then we and we tied it with a because of the fact that you came to see us before will give you some kind of special consideration if you act by a certain date and literally up until the last week of that date we had people lined up outside of the clinic to get a consultation um, millions of dollars were made and I was I'm, I was so proud of myself and that was really where I, I realized there's got to be something with this copywriting thing <laughs> And, and you know that's a great idea anyone in their business probably has a closet like that whether it's on their email or database yep. or there's an actual closet with files piled high it's it's a lot of people say it's by cold list well there's so many ways to revive a cold list there's always an excuse um, in, in, in the internet marketing space which is the one that a lot of people uh, in my industry know more about there's always there's technology always evolving there's always new tools there's new techniques Yes, there are some basics and fundamentals, but people always want to learn what's new, and that's a great foot in the door. And then you can always mm -hmm. always tie it with a promo, um, and then a sense of scarcity and a sense of urgency, a deadline, like I said, with this particular doctor, and you can literally make a ton of money just with this cold list that you're probably sitting on right now that's just gathering dust. Yeah. And you know, Michael's a copywriter. You know, you can't just write anything and have people lined up out the door. What were some of the things you did? You mentioned the scarcity part. What other thing, elements did you put in that copy that worked so well? Well, the uh, 
the, the actual letter itself was really just to do one thing, which is to book a new consultation with the same person to update their file. Mm -hmm. That was the call to action. Please call us to update your file. We'd like to make sure, you know, plus there's a lot of reasons why we'd like to see you again. You know, um, some people's hair loss progress a lot faster than others. So maybe the quote we gave you back then may no longer uh, apply. Um, and maybe even more cost efficient now with the new techniques and so on and so forth. So just enough of an excuse to put your foot in the door to get them to come forward to you is, is, is fantastic. And another thing is a lot of people who have booked an appointment before um, um, may have changed phone numbers, moved, whatever. And it was allowing us to, to update our files at the same time. So then whenever list that we had that that with people would come forward was now a much more warmer and hotter list and now we can actually do upsells or cross sell offers to that for example uh, uh, we also offer uh, or that particular client at that time also offered um, um, toupees and what they call hair systems very similar to hair club for men so people who choose not to go with the hair transplant surgery which is the more uh, expensive form of, of uh, hair restoration they were also offering maybe more of a downsell. Hey, can you maybe this will tie you over? Uh, also, we had different financing plans for people who choose to do financing for surgery. So those are as long as you and and we didn't do all of it at the same time. That would be first of all, you're 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 putting all your eggs in one basket and you're giving away the store too fast. And what I mean by giving away is telling too much. You, so one week will be an offer maybe to update their file. The next week would be an offer on maybe an alternative solution. Maybe the ne then after that would be about maybe financing. So that literally… So you sent multiple mailings. At, in, yes. Never never hit the iron just once. It's the, There's enough ample statistical uh, um, research that proves that conversions go geometrically higher on the second, third, fourth mail out hmm. than just the first one. And the reason is is because people need to be exposed to the offer several times or at least exposed to the product several times if you change your offers. So that not only created a lot of sales for that particular client during that time where we hit we had this special offer, but it literally increased sales for several months hmm. after that from that same cold list. Got it. That's a good point and distinction because I was just thinking, oh, you just sent one letter and then lines were out the door, but you actually sent a, a sequence of, oh, yeah. of mails. Okay. And, and in fact, the client at that time decided to, he had a, a newsletter, <coughs> pardon me, uh, a physical newsletter. And so we decided to, that was a great excuse to send him a copy of the, the, the brand new newsletter that wasn't around whenever they came to see us last time. Because you have to remember that these are these are people who've come who've come to see this doctor years and years prior. Yeah. Um, so this is just a great way to keep in touch. And then a lot of people are calling us and say, uh, you know, please uh, uh, keep me on the list. I'm not necessarily uh, I I able to do it right now, but I, I don't want to lose touch. And I love your newsletter. So that really just kept the the, the list growing geometrically, so to speak, from that point on. So who are you, Michael? Who are your mentors, or who did you learn from uh, about writing copy at that time? About writing copy, well, the, the the strange thing is writing copy itself, I never really learned by it, anyone specifically. Uh, I was just heavily immersed into uh, sales training, sales techniques, sales tactics, and I just translated that into a sales written format. <coughs> Excuse me. So I was into you know Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins. Uh, um, t Roger Dawson, a lot of the top sales trainers at that time, uh, Tony Alessandro, and basically when I wrote copy, I was just thinking of, well, how would I do a sales presentation? And this is what I realized, is I, you write a sales letter exactly the same way that you would do a sales presentation. The, the introduction, the hook, getting them involved, asking qualification questions, then educating them on uh, um, uh, what the product is and how, what's the solution, and then stimulating them on that solution. Actually, this is all part of a formula that I've that I've created called Quest. Think of writing copy as going on a quest. Q U E S T. Qualify, understand, educate, stimulate, and transition. You qualify the reader, and the way to qualify them is not necessarily by by qualifying in in the topic, but 
getting them involved so they know that, hey, this is for me. A great example of that is that client that I was, uh, another client that I worked with was in the facelift um, uh, the, um, industry. Uh, he was a, a very well-known doctor for facelifts. And his, ta his, ta his main headline for his ad was, do you have wrinkles? But, you know, a lot of people have wrinkles and don't care to do anything about it. People might need to do something about it and not necessarily want to do something about it. So we just changed one word, suffering from wrinkles. And that exploded that ad's response hmm. because of that one change. So that's what qualifying means. You means understand, empathy, create a connection. You understand their plight. And they understand that you understand them. There has to be a connection there. And I'm so big on connection. It's such a big thing, a big process for me for copywriting. Educate is then, great, I understand the problem. Here's a, here I'll educate you on the, what the solutions are and what the, po the potential solutions are. And then you, what's my solution and why my solution is better than any other solution out there. And this is where you stimulate them on your particular solution, possibly a sense of urgency, why it's important to go ahead and get the solution now. And then T is transition, which is the, the closing process, which is the taking them from a browser into a buyer, from a reader into a client. So that's the quest formula. And when I, when I learned all that from sales training, it was very, very easy for me to just translate that into written format or in written word. Now, that being said, let me answer your question. Once I became a copywriter and I learned copy and I was doing well with copy, I wanted to hone my skills. I wanted to get better. And some of my mentors at the time was Gary Halbert, uh, John Carlton. Uh, and a lot of I read a lot of the classic copywriters, uh, uh, Claude Hopkins, Scientific Advertising, um, the, uh, Robert Collier's The Collier Letter Book, a lot of these books, um, and 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 Eugene Schwartz, uh, Breakthrough Advertising. So a lot of these books helped me to hone my skills, but at the same time, it got me back in touch with the basics, some of the fundamental principles of of, of salesmanship. And that's that's what helped me in my copy yeah. at that point on. Yeah. So it's that translating the sales process into the copy, and then yep. later you kind of learned kind of what some of those greats were doing also. Um, yeah. So what was another successful campaign that you could break down of why it worked? Um, well, it, 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 the the story that you were telling early on when you introduced me was the uh, the famous million dollar day that a lot of people know me by, and and I call myself the Roger Bannister. A lot of people call me the Roger Bannister of online copy, and the reason why is because I mean that was no record. I I probably set the record, but I that record has been broken so many times by some some copywriters out there who are ten times better than I am. Um, but that was sort of the very first. Uh, sales copy, piece of copy that did over a million dollars in one day. In fact, it, it did it in 18 hours, wow. um, which was uh, John Reese and his Traffic Secrets program. And that was a long sales letter. It was 35, 40 pages long, printed wow. pages. It was, a, it was a long piece of copy. Um, but I, and I learned a lot through with John himself because John, very much uh, a, a genius marketer himself, taught me a lot. And the, the 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 connection that I had with him during the process of writing the copy and getting to understand the audience was fantastic because that's what that's what started me on the path of learning more about the market, which was the fundamental um, the the fundamental strategy of great copy was to learn more about your audience. The more you learn about your audience, the more comes out. In fact, this is the number one key that I tell anybody learning copy. If you're stuck, you've got writer's block, you don't know what kind of ideas or story you want to tell, maybe you, you're, you're stuck in terms of how you're going to present the sales message. Put that aside. If you are, just put that aside and just dive more into the copy, uh, into the market. Find out more about the market. Fantastic tip that I, that I, that I did and I found this out by accident because I, I had, uh, had a client who asked me to do it and it's like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I got to interview his best clients and they raved about the product and they told me all about the product and so I asked more probing questions and I prodded them to tell me more about what's good about the product why did you go with this product oh you went with a competitor before and you hated it why what's better than this product than the other one um, if you had a friend who was in the same predicament as you how would you tell them what, what would you tell them? How would you sell them on this product? They would literally sell me on the product. Yeah. And I would get that interview transcribed and I literally have half of my copy written for me. <laughs> All I had to do was edit. Um, but, but that's the point is that if you have writer's block or if you're stuck at any point, 
the, dive more into your into your market. Learn more. Market research is the fundamental key because the more you know about your market, the more ideas will come at you. Like it'll be like a meteorite shower. Um, you'll get also uh, uh, tons of, of of bullet points that you can talk about, ideas that you can uh, uh, hinge your entire story on, yeah. and plus, it'll make a greater connection with your market because again, the connection is the is the key. The, you can talk. You can have the best piece of copy in the world, and you can have the most targeted, hot, ready-to-buy audience in the world. But if there's no connection, your copy is going to fail dramatically. In fact, it, ha I, it happened to me one time with a with a, a project. Uh, it failed miserably, and we found out that just we tr we turned a lot of the stuff around and bang, and it, then there was a connection. And there was not a lot of changes to the copy. It was just the idea wasn't connecting with them. Um, which which comes back down to something essential that I wanted to talk about, which is a lot of people say copy comes down to two fundamental things: knowing what to say and knowing how to say it. One is a lot of a lot of it is is the idea, the message, the core idea that you want to transfer into your audience, and the next is uh, how you're going to tell that message. Uh, what stories are you going to tell to make that message? Come, you know, get through to your audience. Um, I think the best sales advice I've ever heard was from Zig Ziglar, who said that um, salesmanship is a transference of enthusiasm you have for your product into the minds and hearts of your audience. That is done with the sales copy as well. But a lot of times, you, you people can't see your voice; they can't hear the inflection of your emotions and mm -hmm. your voice. So what you have to do is you have to choose. Uh, words carefully so that it communicates that to your audience in the best possible way. So once you've defined what's the core message, that connection, then you can be emotional. You can use words that will tell that message in the best, most effective way possible, and also the most efficient way possible. Because people don't have time these days. You can you can tell a, a story and take 20 pages to tell that story. People are going to be lost on the first page. Who cares how long or how good the copy is? You have to be efficient. Now, if you can tell that story, the same story, as efficiently in 10 pages, then use 10 pages. You know, a lot of people say, long copy or short copy? Well, just as long as you need in order to make the sale, really. That's the bottom line. Right. And as long as you know what to say and then how to say it, it comes after. And how to say it, it can be tested. This is another thing and a, and a final point, and I'll, I'll, I, you know, I don't mean to take the floor. No, the, I want <laughs> this is your This is your floor. <laughs> The, I'm the, just the, as you see my head go down. I'm just writing notes. So <laughs> no problem. Yeah. The, the 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 thing is, um, and I just lost my my my, my train of thought. Um, the, oh yeah, split testing. So when you know what to say, when you have a good idea, and that comes with market research. Diving into your market, you can find that little hook, that twist, or the the main message that you want to drive in your in your message and your in your copy. Once you've gotten that. You can tell it in so many different ways. You can tell the same story, the same idea in so many different ways. Well, that comes along with testing. And that's what you do is that you once you've defined your copy, your message, and you write your copy, and if it, it sells really well, now your next your next step is to test that copy. Change it around. Change the way the idea is told or the story is told. You can tell your story a little bit differently. Maybe it's a little bit more depressing. Maybe you want to in, in, in inject a little bit more fear in it, or maybe a little more joy in the benefits and why, how powerful the you know all those things. So then you can split test, and then you'll find out that you'll probably be able to increase the conversion rate by telling the story just a little bit differently, but it's the same story nonetheless. So number one, knowing what to say is the crucial, most fundamental thing that will help you make the most sales with copy. Then after that, how to say it. And that can be tested. That so, it, it's actually uh, comes back to a, a very important point: write first, edit later. And that's something I had to struggle with with my Aspergers because I'm a perfectionist. I had when I first started to do this, I had the tendency to stop every single sentence and correct myself all the time. And I had to, to learn. Do. It is hard to not, do. Oh, I had to learn not to do that. I had to learn to just let it flow, just write as much as I can, and I just type furiously. At, oftentimes, not even looking at my screen. And then after that, I would come back and sort of Frankenstein the copy around, put you know pieces here, did the, uh, remove other pieces there, change the, the the paragraphs around, and that's what made some of the best copy that I've ever written in terms of results ever. So. Yeah, Michael. So 
I wrote about 10 questions down. I'm going to ask you two of them. Um, <laughs> All right. Because I didn't want to interrupt you. But um, one of them, I want to come back to where you misjudged the market and then what you did change around for the split test. But before I ask that, I want to know, I think it's so important, and I know you talk about this, is research is key. And talking to those clients was key because those words is what you ended up putting on the page because it's coming from them. What are some of those interview questions? Do you have a core group of interview questions that you do ask when you're talking to the people's best clients? Well, I mentioned a few, and I think one of the most important one is if you, if, if I have a client that is very um, happy, very satisfied with the, the product, and you can tell they're very happy about it. Um, I've, I've actually just recently wrote a piece of copy for a, a weight loss product, and I got, the person gave me a list of names and phone numbers of people that I can call that I set up interviews with, um, I mean, they, they're so happy about the, the weight loss. They're so happy about the finally they've gotten, they found a program, you know, after trying to yo-yo diet for so many years and this program helped them to lose and keep that weight off. Well, what I did is I said, listen, if you, if, do you know people who are in the same situation as you were before, depressed or overweight or whatever the case is, or maybe having tried other programs or either other weight loss products and failed miserably of course they do and I asked them to to may, maybe mention their names what's their first name already right. just so that they can bring it to the top of their minds and then I say okay if you met Sally in a restaurant and they asked you wow you look fantastic with all that you know you lost weight what did you do what would you say and then they would literally sell me on the product or service that would be the number one fundamental greatest question I can ask during those interviews yeah. because they're literally writing the copy for me. And here's another thing. Oftentimes we can do market research based on what the – when I do – when I write copy for a client, the client will tell me what they think are the benefits of the product or the service. But there's so much – there's so many uh, unsought benefits that are never known by the client ever until they're actually in the hands of the user, the end yeah. user. So I tend to ask them, what exactly did you do with the product or service? What kind of results did you achieve? Um, and that, that will give me a lot of information about maybe some benefits and some bullet points that I can add to the copy mm -hmm. that were never part of the original market research. And some of my, um, not all of them, of course, but some of my sales letters that have produced a lot of great results were based on things that I found through interviews that were never mentioned by the, the, the client. Yeah. And that's, that's where I found some of those gold nuggets. Tell me, what were some of those gold nuggets that once they said it, it was never in what the, the owner talked about, but one of the clients told you, and you immediately knew, wow, like I would have never discover this if I didn't have this interview with them. What were some of those? Uh, well, there, 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 are, there are a few. I think that one of the best ones that I've, I remember hearing was a, a, somebody was selling, um, oh gosh, a, a certain kind of, of, of light, um, light bulb that was um, different than your standard light bulb. It helped to uh, light up the room very nicely. Uh, it was softer and it was also more energy efficient and so on and so forth. And we had the, the, the whole purpose of selling these, these light bulbs was um, they were more uh, closer to the, to the sun. I, this was years ago. I have to remember this. So I'm, I'm speaking from trying to remember right. from um, memory here. But uh, when I was asking, I was talking to a client who actually had taken some before and after pictures. And they, um, they also, uh, funny enough, that they were mentioning that whenever they actually took the after pictures, some of the pictures came out with, um, it was, it, they were doing before and after pictures of a room lit by old, like their regular light bulbs. And then when they put the new light bulbs, they discovered things in the picture that they've never saw before. Um, things that helped, for example, when they were doing putting these light bulbs in houses. This is for real estate agents where they would put houses as model model homes, that they were actually helping them sell more homes. With you know, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something something oddball like that. And I was like, great. And plus, it helped me understand that this is probably a great product for real estate agents right. or for people who try to increase the value of their homes. So that was odd because. 
these this is a light bulb seller, a light bulb manufacturer, and all we're doing is selling light bulbs. But in in I was positioning the copy for people who want to enhance the value of their home and how you can actually increase the value or at least the perceived value of your home just by changing the light bulbs. And that was sort of the aha moment that the the manufacturer never knew about and it kind of helped um, create a whole new angle in the copy that helped to increase sales. Um, so, so, I mean, that's just one example and there's so many other examples like this. Very, very often when I do interviews, I also ask for information about how the client was prior to buying the product or enjoying the benefits of the product. Mm -hmm. And here's the reason why. We have a tendency to add testimonials on sales copy, but testimonials, how many how many of, of readers will actually read testimonials from, you know, back to back? Nobody does. I mean, we very rarely read testimonials these days. It becomes, you know, <sighs> boring stuff and that really doesn't mean anything. So what I tend to do is when I do these interviews, especially with interviews that people that actually have provided testimonials already to the client, I will then ask for background information on how, what exactly was their, their, where were they before they bought the product, what exactly were, um, uh, it's sort of a try to get some measurement here, a measurable result. Where were they before and now where they are. And the reason why I would do that is for two reasons. One is it gave me a history behind the testimonial so that the testimonial by itself, it, I mean everybody can say, oh uh, XYZ's product is fantastic, it helped me to do blah. Well that may mean a lot, although that's pretty vague, but it means a lot more if I say, well here's where I was, yeah. here's, here's how uh, bad my situation was before. Yeah. And in fact I tried you know, ABC competitor product and it got worse. Then along came XYZ and here's where I am now and now we've got a point of comparison. So here's my point yeah. is, is I tend to do this now more and more with copy is not just plop testimonials in the middle of copy, I tend to turn testimonials into case studies. Yeah. And a case study will be read much more than a testimonial yeah. but it also gives a measurable… Gives you that reference point. Well a reference yeah. point, I, I tend to tell people this, the best benefits and the best testimonials have have as many of this, the next three items in, included. They have to be measurable qu or quantifiable, measurable, and time bound. So if there's a quantity involved, great. If, there, if there's a baseline against which it can measure it with, that's measurable, that's great. And it can be time bound. You know, I, I can say, well, this program helped me make a million dollars. Well, did it make me a million dollars in 20 years or in two years? Right. See how time bound can actually change things, you know, it can change the perspective. So. You, a lot of people say, "Do I have to have all three? No, no. I, one of the three is best, is better. Uh, two is a lot better, and three is the best. So, if you can find a testimonial that doesn't have any of these three, that's when you call the client up and ask for more detailed background information, so that you can put these three elements in there. What you know, how to make the testimonial quantifiable, measurable, and time bound. And the only way you can do that, or the better way to do that, especially in order to make it um, a lot less." Um, scammy or actually a lot more uh, uh, um, okay by regula you know, government regulations is to turn it into a case study. So now a case study becomes less of a somebody touting the horn versus this is an actual situation where we can actually scientifically look at the before and after results. Yeah. So what elements worked really well in the traffic secrets that you remember specifically? Well, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because it's exactly what happened. Uh, after um, when Traffic Secrets was launched, one of the the the, the main topics in the, the 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 copy, which was not me, it was actually John Reese. John Reese <clears throat> did a seminar. This Traffic Secrets course was actually a recording of his seminar with a lot more material and content added to it. But the seminar was the main story, and he used a lot of analogies and metaphors. In fact, there was uh, I can I remember. Um, in the original seminar, he talks about how we're losing so much money with the traffic hitting our websites. And a great way to example is he took a, a small pail with a little bit of money falling into it. And he says, this is the amount of traffic you think you're getting and, or missing from your website. No, this is. And he goes back and gets a huge bucket full of change and it just pours it and it just flows all over the, <laughs> the table or the floor. And he says, see, and then he pulls out the little cup and says, see, this is what all what you're missing right now. And it was a great analogy because it, it put a picture on it. it. It helped put things in perspective. So that was the number one thing. 
But coming back to what I was saying earlier is about you know testimonials and, and proof. Well, John relaunched his his traffic secrets, and it made I, I can't remember the the numbers, and I I know that I'm probably going to get this wrong, but it's probably a quarter, three quarters of a million, I think, something like that. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but we relaunched it, and all we did was we took the original sales letter, and I added testimonials galore from uh, the very beginning of the sales letter until where the old sales letter started. So it was a, it, before it was a 35-page sales letter, and now it became a 75-page sales letter. Wow. But it was just testimonials. And how we did that was uh, we went back to the people who bought Traffic Secrets, and we asked them to give actual you know, report. We, we, we did some surveys. We found out, well, what were your results? Where exactly? And sort of the same idea of you know, interviewing clients to get uh, some, some uh, before and after type of, of idea. Well, with that, that sales letter, uh, all we did was added testimonials before the original sales letter, and the, the headline was just one word, proof, question, uh, exclamation mark. And a lot of people ask me, can you make money with a one word sales uh, headline? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the proof. <laughs> here's the <laughs> right. Proof. No pun intended. So, that's good. And that, that's what I learned is that you, you can never have enough proof. Now, yeah. um, the power of telling stories, I think you're you're uh, you've, you're well well aware of that because prior to this interview, you're telling me about how people love stories, and that's a, entirely true with sales copy as it I is. I never with, have to tell copywriters that, but it's it's on there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and but telling stories, but also because people love the power of analogies and metaphors and and similes, because people want to put things in perspective. Yeah. And and I tell this. You can you can even have an audience filled with engineers and PhDs, but everybody we are all blessed with the same disease called human being. <laughs> we all have emotions, and I I read copy where I can be very professional in the copy, very clean, uh, not as hypey, but I still can be very emotional when I'm actually selling to engineers and PhDs and doctors, and so on and so forth. And there, there's, not, there's nothing better than the power of story selling, which is telling stories to sell a product or service. Mm -hmm. And that's also another big lesson I've learned through the whole Traffic Secrets and, and from that point on. So, Michael, tell me, I want to go back to the split testing and mm -hmm. that campaign that didn't work and why and then what you changed, what you tweaked with it. Um, well, the biggest changes that I've found, I, I've, I've actually had clients who did a lot of split testing for very small minute things that have caused some small changes and sometimes some immense changes just with the changing of the color of the background, the changing of the font, the changing of the headline, the changing of, of uh, pictures and the positioning of the pictures. But And, and those are, are incremental. You know, I, I tell people this, if you stop split testing, here's what you're you don't realize what you're losing out. Let's say you've split tested the copy in a week from now with a different color, with a different type, or with a different picture, whatever the case is, and you increase it by X percent for the conversion. Great! Then that's your new control. Then you split test it again, then that one didn't do so well, so you come back to your original control. Then you do another split test, and oh, that increased by, let's say, 0 0.3, and another one is 1.2, and another one is 4.5. Well, the incremental increases of, of conversion of your conversion rate is that when you started, let's say your conversion rate was 1.5 percent, very very standard in, in online, for example, online marketing. Well, 1.3 or 1.4 or 1.5 percent, and then a year down the road, it's now 2.6. Excuse me for that. So 2.6 and. The, the, so that's from 1.3 or, or 1.4, 1.5 to 2.6 um, is maybe a whole percentage point. Not may not that be that much, but when you're making um, you know ten, twenty thousand dollars a month, that can literally translate mm -hmm. into a six-figure increase over that one year that you would have not gotten if, if you don't split test. That's money that you've lost that you've left on the table. Now, to to that's just the power of split testing small things. What I have found, and, and, and this, this is funny because it's actually one of my clients that made me realize this. I never found this on my own. It was actually through working with clients who have done this, and I realized, oh my gosh, that we're missing out on so much. The most, the, 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 if, if you're split testing wildly different 
uh, things, maybe two completely different headlines, maybe two different completely stories or two different completely uh, um, offers. The more the more widely different they are, this was this is where you can actually discover crazy increases in conversion rate. And we did this with a client one time where uh, we changed. Um, like like I said, there's there's times where I would add just a few words to the headline and it would change conversion. But this in this particular case, we tested completely different headlines that were totally disparate. They were totally different, and we didn't know this, but it actually doubled sales just because of the, it, it was a whole new topic, a whole new way of of connecting with the market. And I didn't know that. And and he, this gentleman told me this. Actually, his name was Ricky Breslin. He told me. The most, the more widely disparate those are, the or your test, or your test uh, uh, items are, the greater your sometimes the greatest boosts in conversions can be. And sure enough, I from that point on, I tested with different clients, and it's it, that's exactly what happened. So, I say this: you can split test uh, tiny little things, and make sure that when whatever whatever sales letter you're working with is basically your best one that you can do this. But before you do that, you might have completely different conversion rates by testing completely different headlines, two different completely different offers, two different completely uh, completely different I'm, I'm repeating myself, completely different um, uh, storylines. Um, so what were know. those? Do you remember those completely different headlines so we get an idea of what kind of the how different they were? Oh my. Um, you're asking somebody who's written hundreds of sales letters <laughs> in the last 20 years. Um, I, I can tell you that we've had, um, there was a, a gentleman who was in, uh, I was writing copy for uh, the stock market, their stock trading, stock market trading uh, how-to program. And um, I believe it was a, a sales letter that was about, um, he he was he was basically recording himself doing trades, and then he was explaining himself or explaining uh, how how to do certain trades and how to to uh, get the best trades possible. And I think the headline, or the original headline, was something like uh, "Learn learn the best trading tactics from somebody who knows his stuff." It was something like that. A little more generic. Yeah. yeah, and and then um, then what we did is we and then the and the and the, the 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 deck copy and the lead copy, meaning the the first few paragraphs under the headline and then the first few paragraphs just that starts the copy off was hinging on that concept, how to you know to learn from a master trader and all that stuff. Very, not I wouldn't say pompous, but it was very much to prove credibility to to create credibility up front. So what we decided to do is we decided to switch and test some, something like. Um, um, cameras happen to accidentally record um, um, stock trader. Uh, um, well, I wouldn't say accidentally. I don't remember the exact words. I mean, we weren't we weren't exaggerating. We were actually telling the truth. But it was something like um, cam camera captured live trades from a master trader, and he explains. Uh, his best strategies. Um, um, it, it's as if you were looking at his trades over his shoulder, so on and so forth. I can't remember. It was something like that, but it was completely different from the first one, and that proved itself to be a lot more successful in terms of conversions than the first one. Now that's a very small change, but it still it was completely different because the whole concept was you can learn or this person will show. So uh, people, I think, hate to learn. It's it's work. But if you actually show people something, or you were you're doing the teaching, or you're doing the the revealing, or whatever, so rather than saying discover how to you know master the stock market versus this will teach you how to master the stock market, I mean that's just a, a simple example has proven to be a lot more successful in that particular case for that particular market. Not necessarily the case in all cases, of course, but that was actually a good example of that. Michael, so some of the campaigns when I asked about the failed, you wrote. Um, you misjudge the market. You misjudge the market. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, that's what I meant earlier when I said you have to do more research about the market. I see. Whenever I did copy where I thought the market – here's the thing. I have a formula called OATH and it means oblivious, apathetic, thinking, and hurting. Um, it, and I didn't come up with that. This is Eugene Schwartz. He talks about the sophistication of the market, how sophisticated the market is. 
I like call, I like calling it the level of awareness that the market has. If the market is not aware uh, of the problem, then you're going to have to educate them about the problem before you educate them about the fact that there is a solution that exists, Much and harder, then educating right? them on why that solution is is best for them. Yeah, that's harder. So, yeah, so 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 the O means oblivious. They're actually oblivious about the problem, not just about the solution, but about the problem. Those are the hardest markets to work with. And that's where you tend to use longer copy because you need to educate them about What's an example why... of one that uh, someone's oblivious to? Pre-arranged funeral services. You know, a lot of people don't really think about that. It's not something at the top of their minds right. or it's something that they don't. And, and when I say that, I'm not talking about necessarily right now because I think people have a fair good, fairly good grasp of that. But back 20 years ago, that was very new. And so it was, I mean, trying to educate people on, on, on why they should do that or why they should, first of all, that the, this solution exists and why they should do that. It, it was, it, it, a lot more copy was required. Um, but that being said is, the next one is apathetic, which is they are, they're not oblivious. They understand they have a problem. They know the problem. They just don't care. They're apathetic about it. Um, so now you have to, you don't have to educate them about the problem, but you have to educate them on why they need to solve it. Then the next one is they're thinking about it. So they're hurting, they want to do something about it, but they're thinking about it. They may be thinking about different alternatives, different products, they're shopping around, um, they're doing research. So now you've got to inform them on what makes your product better than any other product out there or any other solution out there. And then finally, hurting. They're hurting, they're desperate. Those are usually the people who will buy the fastest and takes the least amount of copies to, to, to sell. But your 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 goal in, in copywriting is to teach them on why they should buy now and buy from you specifically. So this is where you this is all about the offer, uh, a sense of urgency, maybe a scarcity element added to the to the mix. So from O A T H, and misjudging the market is basically where I would write copy for an audience I think is more of a thinking audience when it's really an oblivious market, or maybe I would go after market that may may be hurting for the product. But they don't even understand, fully understand the problem. So I may have to go back to maybe apathetic or whatever. So um, that's what misjudging the market means. So what would be an example of an apathetic market that just they just don't care? That would be hard to sell to, I would think. Um, they don't. They don't care about the problem. Well, that's, I think. I think if is the you, wrinkles one maybe an example? Like some well, people don't care. Well, the, if if I'm writing a, a a a piece of copy for people who want to do something about their wrinkles, they want to do something, then the connection is you know suffering from wrinkles. The people who read that and want to do something about it are suffering. So you're connecting with that market. So you're basically going after the hurting. But maybe if you if you're going after a market that um, now this is not the case for this particular example, but I'm going to use that as an example uh, anyways. If you're going after a market that really doesn't want to do much about it, they're, they, they have wrinkles but they don't really care, maybe you can do is write a piece of copy and educate them about how important it is to look at your best, how you can feel better about yourself. Um, maybe, and I, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm using these very exaggerated ideas here but it's just to prove a point for illustration purposes. Um, maybe uh, having a, a youthful, more look will help you get a career advancement potential. Maybe it'll help you to get that relationship of your dreams. So now they probably didn't care earlier about doing something about their wrinkles, but now, hmm, maybe I should get myself, um, you know, and and, I, and this is actually for a product on um, microdermabrasion, which is basically a cream that helped, it was like a, a home, uh, I, we call it a facelift in a jar where they, people would just put on this cream and help to tighten up their skin and, and reduce the, the look of wrinkles. Well, same idea is that this would be a great way to educate the market where if they're apathetic about it, we're going to take them a bit to the thinking and hopefully to the hurting phase. Got it. So, and sometimes, and sometimes, um, remember we told you about earlier um, the, the process of hitting your market often, hitting your iron more um, uh, over time? Well, that, this is a good example of that. You might hit your market and they might be oblivious. But if you hit them again, you might be able to take them from the oblivious to apathetic, and then and a few more mail outs after that from the apathetic to the maybe I'm maybe I should do something about it, and then that later on there in the hurting, I've decided I'm going to you know do this. I know for a fact in my copywriting business, I have people on my list. I have a list of over forty 
plus thousand people. 46,000. Over 46, and people have years. been on my list for years, and they now come. You know, they come to me and they say, "I've finally decided to take the plunge to hire your your copywriting services, or, or to hire you to do a critique on my sales copy, whatever the case is." And I, you know, I've been following you for all these years, but I was just never, I never th thought about doing it. I was interested in learning more about you, but so, so they were this process of maybe going from apathetic to uh, over time. They okay, I, I think I really knew they need to do something. And you know, I just gave an example of the power of split testing and how not doing any split testing, how much money you're leaving on the table. A lot of people don't know that, so now they're being educated, and that's why they're take they're being taken from the apathetic to, in this case, thinking or hurting why they need to do some split testing and why they should be doing some split testing. So, so when you have clients, Michael, and you probably you know you're an expert at this, and you advise them maybe against certain things, what are some things they don't listen to you on that they should? Well, the, um, the, the split testing idea was one, is one of them, and I'm just going to refer to my notes here uh, because I know that I've, I've written a, f a few of these. Um, uh, oh, by the way, um, the, your question is things that clients do that I tell them not to do, right? right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Because you're kind of stuck in a pickle, right? Because you have to kind of deliver your expertise, but they also have to kind of like what you've produced and it's yeah. kind of like, I don't know, I see it's a little bit of a, can be an well, issue maybe. It, it is. It, it, this is where you have to sort of look out for the red flags before hiring a client because if you have to spend twice as much time educating the client on why they should use your copy versus you know a client who might be willing to use your copy without touching it. Um, it, 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 so there's like a cost benefit analysis yeah. that you'll have to make and that's why I, I have a long yeah. qualification process. Yeah. I don't accept anybody just like that. I yeah. do have a long testimonial, uh, testimonial, a long quotation form that they have to fill out and after that they have a questionnaire that they have to fill out which is a, a 25 point questionnaire. They have to provide me with a lot of answers and a lot of people will tell me, oh my gosh Mike, just answering a questionnaire opened my eyes on so many things that I'm doing wrong. You know, just the questionnaire itself was, was enlightening for them. But for those clients that uh, that didn't answer my questionnaire, if they didn't do the job, that's that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. If they're not willing to do the work, they're not willing to listen to what I have to say, or what you know, if they're not willing to to meet me halfway, so to speak, I know I'm going to have a big hurdle to overcome mm -hmm. because these are the clients that I tend to either a write copy and they'll change it because they think they know what their market better, right. or b they they say. They don't want to use it, and then they. I have to spend hours on the phone with them, trying to convince them on why they should be using my copy. That used to happen a lot in my early career. I don't do that as much anymore. Because you still I, get high-profile people, and they have their own ideas. Even after you have a proven track record, people still come to the table and think yeah. they know more. Yeah. So, yeah. so what have you advised someone against, and and they maybe didn't listen, or maybe they did because they kind of saw that you knew what you were talking about. Well, if the if the client knows their market, I mean, this is where the, the biggest problems I have is people who are in brand new markets with a brand new product that is just has never been launched before. Uh, I tend I tend to steer away from those, or if I do, I make sure a I'm being paid up front, and b uh, there's not a lot of red flags before just to make sure that I don't have a lot of problems. But but those are very very rare. I tend to I have clients who who hire me who know their stuff. A lot of these guys are top copywriters themselves, but they just don't have time. They're probably juggling 10, 20 products and they say, right. "Michael, can you write this guy? I got a new product coming out." And so they know. And a lot of times these are the best clients in the world. They'll just test my copy right away or if they do changes, they will do changes to the copy that I would have approved anyways. So that's that's fine. Those clients that these are the I, <laughs> I have found this to be the case very very often in the medical industry. Um, doctors are uh, in the cosmetic surgery industry, especially doctors, tend to have a they have first of all they have a code of ethics they have to follow. You can't just make blatant claims um, because they can actually lose their medical licenses. So I understand that, but also at the same time, they uh, they there's a there's a I don't want to say that they have a God complex. They, I, that's not what I mean. It's that they feel like they know their patients more than you do. And it's, it's actually very understandable. But when you write copy, 
because you're the third party you can actually see you see a little bit differently from, yeah it, it's it's a different perspective and and very often I used to look at products and services almost like the client does so when I approach the doctor with a piece of copy and I tell them you know first of all this is what I would buy I would buy from if I were to do something about my hair loss or whatever the case is so so but that but it is a little bit hard to work with those clients and and that's why I don't I don't work with a lot of clients, uh, fresh new clients nowadays. I have s just a handful of long-term, high-paying clients that I have very close relationships with, that I have partnerships with, and I have a, a an agency, a copywriting agency, who will take care of a lot of the uh, the the, the B-list projects that I, that come in through our doors. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because these clients that I work with are they're friends of mine. There are people who, who they trust what I have to say, they trust my copy, they've tested my copy, they've done very well with it. So they're usually the people who, you know, when they call me up, they say, Michael, I'm launching this product, how much you want me to wire you today? And I'll say X amount of dollars, <laughs> and that's done, and I'm writing copy. So, right. so but that's, yeah. that took me 20 years, right? It's not something that happened overnight. Right, right. I, I've, I've had many failures and successes along the way, but a lot of failures and a lot of red flags and a lot of clients that I actually had to refund because... I mean, one there was one client in particular who was a big pita, <laughs> uh, pain in the in the buttocks, and and that <laughs> client was I spent tons of energy talking them into using the copy to the point where they've actually never really used the copy, and then they came back and they said, well, because we haven't used your copy, we want a refund, and even though the service was rendered, I say, you know. Just because you've gotten your dentist to fill your tooth, or uh, uh, anyways, I'm, I'm frustrating. Going on yeah, it's it's frustrating. Or or uh, uh, I think the best analogy is just because you've paid for your cable TV, but you haven't watched TV in a, a month, do you call your cable company and say, "Well, give me a refund on the last month's cable"? No. So, anyways, the point is, uh, I and at that time I refunded them because I just didn't want to deal with the hassle. I, in fact, I've already did a lot of hassle, spending a lot of time and energy on those wasted vamp. I call them time, time vampires. Um, took a lot of time and energy away from other copy projects that yeah. I gotten really well paid on yeah. that I could have worked on instead. Yeah. So yeah. the take home so, point is definitely have an ex almost like an extensive onboarding process. Yes. So that you can weed the people out who are really serious. And then you get a really good idea of who you're dealing with, and I don't think we do that enough. And you, yes, and, and the qualification process is so crucial. Ask red flag questions, questions that if they answer in a certain way or if they don't answer at all, will raise red flags. And and I have a I have a 25 point questionnaire, and I have a three a three strike policy or a, a three red flag policy. If there are three questions that raise red flags, I don't take the client on at all. If I have one red flag or two, I might say, okay, maybe they're workable with or there's yeah. a way to, to, to work around it. Yeah. Uh, but if I have three or more red flags, I will not touch yeah. that client with a 10-foot Ethernet cable. <laughs> we don't want to reveal all your red flags because we don't want someone, when they fill it out, to uh, you know, know what you're thinking. But what's one of the red flag questions that you have? Well, 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 I, I I mentioned one earlier, which is if they don't even take the time to answer my questionnaire, who says they're going to take time to use my copy right. or to actually follow my my my? If they can't follow simple instructions, who says they're going to you know use my copy and follow my instructions? Right. Um. So the the bottom line is, uh, I have my questionnaire is actually divided into three major categories. One is about the product, the other one is about the business, and the other one, especially the the third one, which is about the market, and. The, 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 sometimes I will ask a question like, for example, um, like, very much like the same questions you've asked me in, in your questionnaire prior to this interview. What are some of your biggest successes and what are some of your biggest mistakes? Well, in a copywriting questionnaire are, you know, what are the six most common objections that people have about your product or service? Mm -hmm. Or what are the six most common things that people confuse you with your competitors with? Um, and that gives me a lot of insight into if the client really understands their market, mm -hmm. very often I have clients who say they have a winning product, they say have the, they have a fantastic market, but when it comes to answering those questions, mm -hmm. you can see that they're either not answering it fully, they're not giving me all six, or they'll give me six, but there are six like that were just written really quickly just to get the questionnaire done. Um, that's a red flag. Yeah. And Or they say they know their market, 
but they know their market just from the, the perspective of generic market research. Anybody can do generic market research. I mean, how often have you picked up the phone and actually spoke to one of your clients? Or how often have you actually uh, 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 got, gathered some feedback about your product or service? A lot of people tend to have the best, um, the, you know, they have a good client list, they'll have a lot of good sales, and they'll probably have some some glowing testimonials that because they've they people have sent it to them but that doesn't tell me that that's how people feel across the board right so yeah i will probably ask questions about their best clients but i also want to know clients who have frustrations even sometimes non clients are yeah. are great sources of information and if they if they're not willing to give me some of that in the questionnaire because they're afraid that i might know too much that's a red flag Mm -hmm. I want to know. I want to know some of your your failures. I want to know some of your mistakes because mm -hmm. I want to know how I can position your product so that that doesn't happen again, or that mm -hmm. people can understand your product better than the competitors. And if they're not willing to do that because they've got something to hide, then that's that, that, that's a big red flag. Yeah, Michael. And obviously, you've had tons of successes. What's been a painful moment in business for you? What's been some low points for you? From a professional standpoint, um, I think... I guess what I'm doing is, I didn't realize, but probably what you teach is that reference point, right? If we just say you're a, you know, you say it's so important in your case studies to do that reference point, uh, and right. I just realized it because you, you told me, but I think that's why I asked this question, because if we just see you as this raging success, we don't have a reference point there. Oh. You know, it, so. I've had trust me. I've, I I licked my wounds many times in my life, uh, from dealing with pain clients, with time vampires, to dealing times with when it was when it was dry. Um, I mean, I've had a handful of clients that kept me, you know, th that helped my survival. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't the most prosperous times. Big recessions we've went through in the last twenty years. We we went through two of them, and sometimes it was a little uh, uh, distressful. And on top of the the personal issues that I've told you about, for example, my wife having her cancer come back, yeah, and then dealing with chemotherapy and and uh, uh, weekly trips to the hospital to the cancer yeah. center, and uh, that takes a lot of time away. All those things can be. Uh, painful yeah. but it's it's especially painful when um, you're trying to find time to not only do the work that you're hired for but also find time outside of that to market your services to get more clients um, those were I mean it's not the case today of course but it was years ago whenever we went through a recession it was it was a hard time for me and uh, it's especially true when you have a client who uh, is in an industry that's very um, um, scam prone or or recession prone uh, or, or, or uh, recession uh, uh, they, they're hurt by the recession and the reason why it's it's difficult is because the it's not about billing your client or anything like that it's about when you have a client who is testing your copy it you're they're limited by how much of a budget they have to advertise for the copy and all that so mm -hmm. Very often, I'll have a piece of copy that I know will be a great winner, and I can actually, and this client can also hire me for other products. But because they're limited in how they can test the copy, it ends up being either a failure, or we're not be we're not able to test it enough, or whatever the case is. Or the client, who, um, and, and just to go back a little bit of what happened before when I first started out in copywriting, I used to ask for no deposit to uh, half as a deposit. To nowadays, I ask for the full amount up front. And the reason I do that is because that is another red flag. If if I have a client who starts to you know to bitch about uh, paying me uh, a deposit, I know that they're not serious or they're going to be a problem down the road to get m my bills paid. Right. So nowadays it's no longer an issue. But in the beginning of my career, uh, I I I had clients who never paid their bills. I had to run after clients uh, legally and and uh, and also assume a lot of losses. And when you're a, a struggling copywriter, uh, we're talking 20 years ago, a freelancer, um, and then the first recession hit, that was, that was really hard. But luckily, I have a lot more successes to, to, to that shadows those. But it made me realize one thing is you always have your handful of steady clients 
that are, that your partners, your friends, and also your own businesses, because we also have our own businesses that are producing income on the side, yeah. so that there's a constant flow that you don't have to worry about ever being dry ever again. And and I, I we tell the story, my wife and I, because her company is like that, where whenever she found out she had cancer, and she was able to take a couple of weeks off so that she can do chemotherapy and all that, right. uh, almost a month, and then she would come back to her business, and the business was still running smoothly. We had staff taking care of everything. That's the the wonderful part about being in business online, especially with uh, um, um, a service business, a copywriting business like mine, where you have staff taking care of a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, it's 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 a nice feeling to be able to to you know not have that worry anymore. But yeah. it was for when you're struggling. One time, a single copywriter with your own business, it, yeah. it was tough. And I know, you, Michael, you're talking about before we started, we were chatting, and you mentioned about your wife. And <laughs> how do you? Um, I don't know the right question is, but how do you both? What do you find? You seem both, you know, so optimistic and just forge ahead. How do you deal with? Or I guess tell people what you told me with what the doctor has told your wife, and then how do you? you know, forge ahead and cope with that in a positive way like you both do. Is it easy? No, it's not. Um, I think that the, the trying to look at things and it put everything in perspective. Everything in perspective is so much different. Putting everything in perspective. Um, my wife and I, we, we, my wife has a great saying. She says, um, when, when you're in the dark, and you want to fight the dark, do you pull a knife out? Do you pull a gun out? Or do you just simply find the light switch? Um, so trying to fight the dark with, with darkness is not going to solve anything. But by just flipping on the light in a, in a, in a world of darkness uh, can change perspective so much. And my wife is a great example. She's a beacon of, pos of positivity and, and optimism to the point where when she goes to the chemo ward, the nurses are actually fighting to, oh, to, find, to, to, to find out who's going to be the nurse taking care of her during her chemo session <laughs> because she's such a positive person and they yeah. all love her. And we actually, whenever we actually have chemo, we have nurses that will see on the computer that she's in that are completely at the opposite side of the hospital that will come in just to visit her to say hi and how's it going hmm. um, because she's such a positive person. But my point is this, is the, the, the power of perspective is so important. Every time you have a situation where it seems like it's the darkest, gloomiest, most uh, negative situation in your life, always look at times when it was worse or look at other people who have it a lot worse. And that will kind of put things in perspective because mm -hmm. once you know that it's you – know, every time we I, – I, for example, for me, whenever I was in my darkest times, I was always focused on that one thing and I had to sort of break out of that, not by – getting positive but by looking at cases that were worse and that would put a perspective makes you feel uh, lucky oh well way. exactly when I when I go to um, the chemo ward with my wife my wife is she's a bubbly personality she makes all of the the nurses laugh but you wouldn't believe how many other people that because we're, we're sitting in this these are called they're called pods at the Ottawa Cancer Center uh, where you've got several pods where they've got four or five chemo chairs in one pod and there's like six pods. So whenever she goes into a pod, we're surrounded by four or five other cancer patients who are getting get, receiving chemo. Mm -hmm. And there's always two or three that they're you know, they're you can sense that they're that they're they're down, they're depressed. And that puts things in perspective, number one. But number two, what my wife tries to do, and I, I love her for that, is that she'll try to talk with them. She'll try to cheer them up. She'll try to bring some sh sunshine in their lives. And it's strange because they're happy for that. In fact, my wife will leave the chemo uh, ward with uh, people giving her phone number to, to some of those patients. And we get random phone calls. That might have been one just, <laughs> just a while ago of Patients just calling her just to get a supportive uh, cheer yeah. me pick me up, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's it's something that I found through one of my favorite mentors is Jim Rohn, and Jim Rohn once said that if you have a problem in your life, you have a challenge in your life, the way to get out of it is to find somebody else with the same challenge and helping them out, because it really does. I mean, you either it puts things in perspective, but at the same time, by the from the process of teaching or helping the other person or supporting the other person you will discover seeds of how you can better yourself. Yeah. 
and it and it, that's sort of what helped us out. Anyways, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that because I thought it was so powerful. And I didn't want to to miss it. And um, I know you have to go. I wanted just to have you, if you have a couple more minutes, to tell people where they can find you, a little bit about your services, so they can can check you out. Sure. Do you have a few more minutes? Well, I know you have a phone call that you have to get on. Yeah. No. No worries. Um, here's the thing. Um, if you want to know more about me, in my, in, I have a personal blog uh, where I have some business articles, but I also post a lot of my own personal stuff. Uh, it's michellefortin.com or michaelfortin.com. Either way, with the A or without the A, it'll yes. still go to the same place. M-I-C-H-E-L-F-O-R-T-I-N.com. Yes, yeah. dot com. And that's, that's my, my personal blog. My copywriting agency is successdoctor.com. And um, my uh, my main guy there is Andy Katsumanis, and Andy uh, is with me and his wife Sean Katsumanis. We run the agency together. Um, if you have a need for copy, you can just go there and ask for a free quote, and see if there's a uh, we can work together that way. I offer copywriting services, but one of the most common services that I offer nowadays is critique consultations where people already have existing pieces of copy and they want to run it by me to see what I think and we spend an hour together, we record yeah. everything on video so that they have it for future reference and then I literally tear their copy apart, give them suggestions uh, and then how to improve your own copy. And so and that's those are the, my two main businesses and the one business that I have with my wife is workaholicsforhire.com uh, which is providing customer support services and project management services to, to staff websites um, her, the biggest one, of course, is customer support, and you can find more information at workaholicsforhire.com. I think my wife is going to call that on my behalf. No. <laughs> <laughs> we we have a lot of we had a, a we have a lot of large companies, and but but our main clients, most of our main clients, eighty percent of our clients are single entrepreneurs or small business, yeah. small home based businesses yeah. who grow so much that they can't handle their customer support anymore. And and my wife is a, a, a master of not only handling that stuff, but also helping you reduce your refunds and your chargebacks, because a lot of times people who, for example, ask for a refund uh, might be asking for it for the wrong reasons or might not necessarily know X Y Z about the product. And she she's fantastic at at making clients fall in love with you if they haven't if they haven't fallen in love with you yeah. already. So. That that's a, a service that that uh, we offer that is probably one of the most um, uh, asked for services besides copywriting. Yes, Michael, and everyone should check that check out your site. Design's beautiful. And the last question I had for you is your proudest accomplishment. You put you lost a hundred pounds. Yes. Uh, long story short. I mean, the, there's so many stories like that we could probably talk for three hours for, and then you you just throw that one in like it's nothing. But well, well it, 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 because what happened was it, at that time I was like writing copy for the health and wellness industry, but I was personally uh, I was overweight. Uh, I had gallstones. I had gallstone attacks that were excruciating, um, and I was I had herniated discs. I had two herniated discs. Uh, and degenerative uh, disc disease, and I was walking around with two canes and a back brace. Wow! At one point, I remember going to a seminar where I literally walked on stage with a cane to speak to the audience. Um, and my mother, uh, um, on her deathbed, said, "You're fat," and that stuck with me. And it was it was it was like a, a switch in my mind that just turned on. It's like, okay, I, this this that was the it. that was it, that was the uh, and then and then sure enough. I went to see my doctor because I wanted to get on uh, on a fitness program. I went to see my doctor. He told me I was pre-diabetic. Uh, I was literally on this on the cusp of becoming a diabetic, a full-blown diabetic, and that was like okay, that's that's the sign that I really need to do something. So I started working out on a regular basis, and in uh, one year I've lost 100 pounds. I went from 262 to 168. Wow, amazing. So, yeah, and, and and now I've I've gained back some weight and muscles because now I do powerlifting. I actually have a home gym, and I do an hour to an hour and a half of powerlifting training every day. Um, but now I can deadlift four hundred pounds. You know, this is a guy who used to walk around with two you know two canes wow. and a back brace, who can barely lift a bag of groceries, who's now deadlifting four hundred pounds. Um, so was it just but, exercise? I mean, what did you do to lose a hundred pounds? Wow. That weight training. Weight training is it, starting slow but sure. 
um, I think the best the best advice I've ever gotten was um, one of my clients who actually is the guy who got me into this because he was he actually had a, a training program called University of Abs Anthony Leone I met him at a seminar and uh, he ta he taught me how to do weight training and he said you can have disc disease or joints or arthritis whatever the case is that means your skeleton is working too much by itself you need to strengthen your muscles to give more skeleton to your skeleton it's like giving scaffolding to your to your to your building blocks so to speak and the stronger my muscles gotten the less stress on my joints were the more they had time to regenerate and grow mm -hmm. and that's what helped me is and it of course it's a process of, it took a whole year um, and now it's now it's officially two years now. It's it's March remarkable. 17th, March seventeenth was actually my two year anniversary. Congratulations! Of, uh, wow. Thank you. Um, but but that's that's sort of what also exploded my copywriting business in the fitness field because now I have several clients that are specifically in the weight loss, fat loss, and and weight uh, lifting fields. So yeah. I have I have uh, a personal uh, case study. Yeah, well, that's well, it, and it's it's sort of the, the the what I was telling you earlier about my Asperger's. I dove into that whenever I found out that I had to do something about it. Right. I dove in head first, and I knew so much about it that finding a client who wanted to hire me was so easy because they say, "Hey, you know already. Not only did you do it yourself, but you know so much about it. You probably even know more than me." So it was easy for me to write copy, and that's what um, got me to where I am now. Yeah, Michelle, I just want to be the first one to thank you so much. I've enjoyed this okay. conversation, and I'm holding off. I have like. 10 questions here written down. I'm, I'm holding off. I know you have a call. I mean, one, like, I don't even know how you do this. You, your wife, you have four kids. I think you have four kids. Yes. Right? How you manage it all. But that's for another conversation. So I just want to thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much.